A few weeks ago, I stood in a packed room in City Hall at a zoning commission meeting. There were over 200 of us there. Many people who were there were people with disabilities. The meeting was supposed to be fairly short. Uh, That's something one should always keep in mind when dealing with the city of Elgin, I gather. Uh, Fairly short in this instance turned out to be over five hours. The meeting started at 7, and they had many things on the agenda, including our issue. And so I was not out of the meeting until after midnight. Some of you were there with me. We were a group of people who were trying to get the Zoning Commission to consider a residence for persons with disabilities to be built in the place where the Larkin Center now stands. The Larkin Center has been vacant for four years now since it was closed down. At the end of the day, or actually it was the beginning of the new day, the chairman of the zoning committee took stock of those of us who were still there. Um, We had gone from some over 200 to a meager less than 50. And he asked us, after he closed the conversation for from public uh, comment for those of us who supported this zoning change to stand up, and we did. And then for those who uh, supported it, did I say opposed first? I hope so. Okay. And those who supported it to stand up, the vote was 43 in favor, three against. It was an awe-inspiring meeting for me. One of the few times I felt that I could actually stand in a public place and speak for those whose needs are so great. For the 10 apartments in that, in that place that hopefully will be built, there are 500 disabled people waiting. As someone said as we walked out the door that night, you got to start somewhere. Well, today we're going to hear the very end of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth in chapter 15. As you may recall, the church in Corinth has been a problem for Paul for a very long time. And he has saved his best for last because this last chapter has some of his most wonderful news. It starts out with the words, Behold, I tell you a mystery. So listen with me to this portion of chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, And this mortal body must put on immortality. And when this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O death, is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in the 15th chapter of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 
He has talked about very many issues. If you read the entire letter, 1 Corinthians, you will see he touches on a whole variety of problems that they were having in that church. I guess churches have always had problems. At least that's the way it would appear in 1 Corinthians. But we get to the place now where Paul is going to address his biggest concern with the church in Corinth. And that concern is unity. Paul believes that unity is the key to solving the problems of the church and the key to much more. Paul tells us that we are all in Christ. Now those two words, in Christ, you will find throughout all of Paul's letters to churches. What he's talking about when he says we are all in Christ is that we are all encompassed by God's great salvation work through Christ Jesus. And together, we are in Christ participating each and every day in the redemption, not only of ourselves, but of the whole world. We are in Christ. So what would you say is Paul's biggest concern? Exclusion. He feels that exclusion is the wall, the barrier that keeps us from being fully the people that we have been created to be. But in fact, we are all in Christ. And so Paul begins then to talk about the resurrection. The reason why he's talking about the resurrection while he's discussing unity is because the resurrection is what makes our unity possible. Because Christ was raised from the dead, we can all participate in his wonderful resurrection. But what Paul is talking about when he talks about resurrection is really not what I was taught resurrection was. Uh, in my church, nor what I came to assume or believe as the years went by. So it came as a great surprise to me, not so many years ago, that the resurrection Paul is talking about isn't the same as my idea. Let me explain. I was basically taught that we have immortal souls. So what is going to happen when we die is that we are going to shed These bodies, these bodies that we now have, we will shed, and then our soul will rise up into heaven. Do you know the immortality of the soul is nowhere to be found in the scriptures? That's Plato. (laughs) That's Plato, the philosopher. What does the Apostles' Creed say that we recite so many times a year I believe in the resurrection of the body. I can tell you that believing in this idea of we're shuffling off this mortal coil and our souls just are going to rise up into heaven, that's an easier belief than what's in the Apostles' Creed. But Paul envisions the resurrection this way. We are not just going to shuffle off this body. We are going to be given new bodies. Do you remember in the Gospels when Jesus was raised from the dead? Did he have a body? He did. Did people recognize him? They didn't. They didn't. His his immortal body was different than the body that he had while he was alive and walking on earth with the disciples. Well, something very similar is going to happen for us as well. Because God is going to clothe us with an immortal, imperishable body and raise us from the dead. I find that amazing. Perhaps you have always understood it better than I. But let me start with this. Do we think these bodies are important? Don't answer right away. Don't answer before considering 
that what we do with our bodies is smoke, overeat, drink too much, we're too idle. There are so many things, and there are many more things we do to our bodies to try to make ourselves more beautiful, etc. God believes our bodies are so precious. They are going to be raised from the dead. So do we care about bodies? Well, what about all those bodies in our world that are abused, tortured, bodies who are lost in in mass murders and wars, and many, many other things? And we turn our faces away from that. It's just another body, but it isn't not to God. No, our bodies are so precious to God. No matter how they look to us. And yet, we look at bodies as being just something that might we don't have to always have. This is not what scripture teaches us. We are taught that these bodies will be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of, the, of an eye. And Paul describes all of that change in the context of unity. The resurrection made it possible for all of us to join Christ in his resurrection. Not just some of us. All of us. All of us are going to be changed. There is going to be a continuity between our life here on earth and our life after our death. You know one of the most frequently asked questions to me as a minister isn't, will I be able to go to heaven? Once in a while I run into that, but not too often. Do you know what people are worried about? Will I recognize my children? Will I recognize my mother? Will I see the friends and know who they they are? And this scripture teaches us that bodies will always be a part of us and that we will recognize, just like Jesus was finally recognized after he was resurrected from the dead, There is a continuity. But Paul will not let us talk about resurrection without emphasizing the reality of sin in our midst. Sin is the thing that prowls the streets of our our world, that infects our desires, that interferes with our deepest hope. All of this must be redeemed, and it will be. We are being fashioned every day by God with many a tear, many a sorrow, through many difficult circumstances. In fact, often our most difficult circumstances are the times when God is fashioning us so much. And those are the times that we get the glimpses of eternity. Glimpses we get, you know. We don't see the whole thing. But once in a while, something will cross our path and we will say, what was that? That was a glimpse of eternity. And we have that eternity now. We just don't recognize it all the time. But we are not the only part of this story. God is about the business of redeeming the whole wide world. This whole world is going to be redeemed along with us. How did we ever get the idea that we could have some salvation of our own little soul, apart from the rest of the world, in our own little home, and God would leave everyone or anyone else behind. How did we ever get that idea? That's not in scripture either. We are redeemed 
together in unity, not in our separateness. In fact, if we were redeemed in our separateness, God would not be able to transform the whole world because this whole world is all of one piece. And if one tiny little speck of it does not get redeemed in God's kingdom, none of us will. We are all knit together and we're all going to be raised. That's what Paul is talking about. So, you know, several years ago, there was a series of books called Left Behind. And uh, I, I read the first book. I only read the first book, and I'll tell you why. Um, the first book planted in me this horrible fear that I've had ever since being raised in an extremely conservative church and being told that I was going to go to hell uh, if I didn't confess every single one of my sins, of which I could not remember them all. So I was constantly in a state of fearing that. And the book left behind, the first book even, emphasized that to me again. And I began once again that, to experience that horrible fear of, of perishing without hope, alone. And that is not something that is going to happen to us. This so-called fear-based Christianity is not biblical. It's not biblical. We are all brought together in God's salvation. And Paul would like for us to steep ourselves in the reality of the resurrection. That is why he saves it for the very end of this chapter for the very end of his letter. Paul wants us to have that resurrection hope that none of us are going to be left behind, that God is sweeping all of us together, and God is going to redeem this broken, rapidly warming world together with us, all of one piece. That is the story of Scripture. Can we steep ourselves in this knowledge? Paul wants us to. You know, Paul talked a lot about his death. He was not afraid to talk about death. He spoke of it often. But he also talked about this hope. This hope that is real because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he wants us to fill ourselves up with that reality of that resurrection. Why? Because it will enable us to walk into this broken world, to bind up the afflicted, to care for those who have needs, like those handicapped persons who were in the zoning commission meeting that night. We will be equipped to go and stand with the oppressed. And we do not have to worry about our own lives or the lives of our loved ones. Why? Because we are all going to be raised together. We are all safe. And we are all God's children. And we always have been. There is nothing to fear. We can be about the business of building God's kingdom right now. There is nothing that stands in our way. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That is what I mean when I say to you, I believe in the resurrection.